Hi there. Welcome to the Exchange Server 2016 course on Client Access Services. This course is part of a four-part series on Exchange Server 2016 that we're hosting and we will focus on client access services in this course. Now, client access services is really important because unless your clients connect to the Exchange Servers, they won't be able to send mail. So Everything starts with the client. That's where the mail idea starts in somebody's head and it needs to go somewhere. So he's going to use Outlook or he's going to use some client to connect to Exchange and send that mail. So client access services is really important. So, uh, but before we start, let me just tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Martin Kutzer. I'm a content developer at Microsoft Learning Experiences, which means I'm a, uh, I write courses. Uh, for Exchange, Skype for Business, and Office 365. I'm an MCSA in Office 365, and I was also part of the teams that helped develop those um, uh, certifications. I am also uh, a, used to be a consultant with Microsoft deploying these very technologies that we are going to talk about today. So uh, lots of field experience, experience of the real world examples, and I've seen a lot of bad things and good things <laughs> with Exchange over the years. And uh, before I was a consultant, I was a software developer um, doing mainframe programming of all things. Uh, but I saw the light and I moved to Exchange. Uh, with me is Joe. So Joe, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thanks, Martin. Uh, my name is Joe Turek. I'm a consultant with Olive and Goose. I've been with Olive and Goose just shy of a year now. Uh, primarily uh, in a business consulting fashion where I'm doing some technical writing uh, for uh, partners, uh, mostly writing about Exchange and Office 365. Uh, prior to my tenure with uh, Alvin Goose, I was with Microsoft also for about 16 years. I was a senior um, support engineer uh, supporting Exchange. Uh, exchange clients, so Outlook Connectivity, Outlook Web Access, what's called Outlook on the Web right now, which we'll talk about a little mm -hmm. bit. Um, exchange Active Sync, those technologies, Outlook Anywhere. Um, and during that tenure, I, I wore many hats, one of which was uh, in 2007. I was the, the beta engineer for Exchange 2007. Uh, I wrote a couple white papers, one of which was the infamous Auto Discover white paper. Uh, back in the day, during, I don't know if you remember Exchange 2000, but we had conferencing server. Yep. Uh, I uh, co-wrote uh, those papers as well. And uh, I look forward to uh, talking about client access services in Exchange 2016 with you. Okay. Sounds interesting. So, uh, client access services uh, is about uh, the how do clients connect to your Exchange servers. Uh, we're going to talk about the service. Previously, we would have said client access servers, but now we talk about client access services because the client access server is now part of Exchange, uh, the mailbox role. Then we're going to uh, dedicate a module on Outlook on the web. Uh, so there's a few new things on Outlook on the web. And then we're going to also go into mobile messaging. Mobile messaging is today really important because a lot of people actually access their mail through mobile devices. It's not just people sitting in the office with Outlook open, but you have your mobile device so you're never away from your mailbox. Um, it's there with you inside of the form field theater, it's there <laughs> with you, uh, you know, wherever you go, just maybe not on the plane. <laughs> But uh, mobile messaging is another client that's really important and you need to support those. Then we're going to go and look at address lists, address lists and address list pol policies. Those are important because the, it's the view of what all the users are in your organization. And then we're going to go into how do we plan the client access services for internet access? How do people connect to this? And then finally, we're going to wrap up with high availability and site resilience for client access protocols. I want to just remind everybody that this course is about client access services, but we have a detailed course on edX, and there's a link on screen, uh, aka.ms slash CLD 208 2 which actually is a full course with labs and all the detailed examples that you want to know about Exchange Client Access Services. So 
I want to really um, suggest that uh, if you want to know more, if something sounds unclear or if you feel like we didn't go into a particular topic uh, deep enough, then uh, check out that course. So uh, with that, uh, let's set some expectations. So are you in the right place? Did you click on the right video? <laughs> so the, our target audience is people that are interested in Exchange Server 2016 or Office 365 because a lot of these um, concepts like uh, uh, the features, managing the features also applies with uh, our, uh, Office 365. So uh, if you're somebody that wants to deploy Exchange Server 2016, then uh, you're in the right place. Uh, we also want to make sure that you are um, familiar with some default concepts like Windows Server 2016, uh, 2012, sorry, all the roles and features that's available in Windows Server, and uh, specifically Active Directory as well. Exchange is heavily dependent on Active Directory, and we're going to throw terms around like AD this and user that and so on, and uh, we're just going to assume that you know Active Directory. So uh, if you need to know those things, and if you don't know anything about Active Directory, then I would suggest that you go look up a course on uh, the Microsoft Virtual Academy on Active Directory so that you're familiar with those concepts as well. So which brings me to the MBA community. Uh, make sure that you join this MBA community. There's lots of courses out there. Uh, you'll be part of 3 million people, more than 3 million people, that gets information from Microsoft uh, on our products and so on. So there's stuff on developer training, there's stuff on IT Pro stuff. So, so there's so many uh, training courses on there and uh, we keep them up to date. And so make sure that uh, you, you form part of this virtual academy uh, community and then you can get lots of information from Microsoft directly. But let's get started with uh, client access services. So client access services, uh, in this module, uh, we need to just do a little bit of history and talk about client access services, how it evolved over time. Uh, we're also going to talk about auto discover uh, and we're going to talk about Outlook connectivity and other um, client access services. But client access services is a really important concept in exchange. People forget sometimes about the end user. They think about the servers, especially if you're an administrator, you just want your server to be up. You don't care about how they connect to the server or how they uh, need to resolve uh, names so that they will be able to connect to that server securely or that it's always available. You just worry that the exchange service is up. So uh, people need to think about client access service and, and make sure that it's configured properly so that you can give your users that good experience and you know they would not complain and phone help desk. So um, in this first module, again, uh, if we talk about client access services that is in Exchange 2016, uh, we need to sort of give you a bit of history around client access services. So Microsoft introduced the client access server role in Exchange 2007. And this was really because uh, we had so much stuff for Exchange servers to do, so many operations that a exchange server had to execute that we had to start separating those uh, operations into different servers because one server couldn't do all of those things like it, one server used to do in Exchange 2003. So we had to split those roles into different components. Uh, but then, you know, there was a lot of hardware innovation that took place and it was no longer necessary after Exchange 2007 to split those roles because a lot of the hardware, CPUs and memory and so on caught up again and we could bring those roles back. So back in Exchange uh, 2013, we brought the unified messaging server and the hub transport server back, but the client access server was still a separate server. That client access server was a little bit different from Exchange 2010, but it was still separate. And, but in, now in 2016, we also combined the client access server in 2016 into the architecture. So now you only have one mailbox server 
that runs everything on that mailbox server, including the client access services. That's right. And uh, in the same token, it still operates similar to what it did when there was a separate service role. I mean, the clients still connect through the client access services layer of the mailbox server, and from there, they're either, uh, depending on what kind of client, they're either proxied or redirected to the backend endpoint on the mailbox server that has the active database for that, the, for that user. Yeah, so you can uh, really separate those two concepts uh, virtually, even though it's running on the same server, uh, that server is capable of running all of those services, and you can still separate them as two different concepts. And if you look at this diagram uh, that we have, you have client access services that runs on that server. So this big gray box is the server, the mailbox server that runs client access services and the backend services. Those are the mailbox database and the transport and so on. But the client access services still runs as a separate area. So uh, when a client connects from the internet, for example, or from your intranet, and they connect to their mailbox, it will go to IIS, um, it's say it's uh, RPC over HTTP, it will use the RP HTTP proxy process, and then it will connect to IIS on that same exchange server. So whatever protocol comes into client access service, client access service will basically do two things. It will authenticate that user to make sure that he's a valid user. Once the user is authenticated, it will then connect to the backend side where the mailbox database is. So if uh, it is uh, using the same protocol as using it did, this it came it, in from the internet. Yes. So it's always, always the same protocol. So if it's HTTP that comes in, it will be HTTP that goes back to the mailbox, uh, the backend services. And if it's POP3 that came into the client access service, it's uh, the authentication takes place and then it will connect to the POP3 on the mailbox uh, backend services as well. So that's the same protocol that goes in and out the client access services. And that could be the, the, the same server. Yeah. It could be a different 2016 server in the same site, or even a 2016 server in a, in a different site. Um, but still, the, the, it's the client access services layer that gets that connection and then uses the same protocol to communicate with the backend endpoint on whichever server it is that has the active uh, database for that mailbox user. Yeah, so the client access service is a proxy. Sometimes the client access service doesn't proxy. Sometimes it redirects, so it sees. For you, you, unified messaging, I think. Yes, right. and so it would then uh, say, when somebody connects into the client access service, it authenticates, it says, yes, this is a valid connection, and it will say, okay, uh, this is unified messaging uh, traffic. I'm going to redirect you to the unified message process in the background just to uh, allow you to connect. But also, if you're connecting to a client access uh, service that is not in your site, maybe there's a place that is better located, that's closer to your mailbox, then the client access service will also redirect you to an endpoint that is closer to your mailbox database, if you've configured your exchange environment to be like that. So if you've configured your exchange environment to redirect users, say somebody connects to your North American data center, but their mailbox is in Europe, then you redirect them to Europe uh, using the client access services. But this is something that you consciously set up to work that way. So uh, in terms of supported client versions, so here's a list of supported clients that runs on Exchange servers. Uh, so it's very simple. We support Outlook 2016, that is our latest version. But then if you go down to earlier versions of Outlook, then you have to go into this territory of hotfixes and supported uh, service packs and things like that. So Microsoft always updates their software, obviously, and so you have to make sure that you're running on the latest and greatest updates to allow those clients to be able to connect to the Exchange server. Some previous clients, like Outlook 2007, is not on here anymore because Microsoft doesn't support Outlook 2007 anymore. When uh, uh, you run Outlook 2007, we're going to recommend that you run uh, upgrade those to Outlook 2010. 
Also Outlook on the Mac, so you need to support the latest Outlook on the Mac client. The previous versions of Outlook is no longer. Oh, uh, uh, one of the ones like Entourage uh, 2008 uh, works, but not the one that relies on web dev. Like yeah. So other clients as well that uh, um, we support is like Windows 10 mail clients that it actually just uses ActiveSync. Windows, the mail client that's built into Windows 10 and also into Windows 8, those um, clients just uses ActiveSync, so they are supported. Obviously, all the clients out there that uses ActiveSync in their stack, there's many mobile phone brands, uh, all the popular ones have ActiveSync built into the phone operating system. So uh, it's important that you run the, run the latest uh, updates on your phones as well so that they will be able to, to use all the best features that are supported in ActiveSync. And then at the end of the day, we have the lowest common denominator. So if you don't have any Outlook clients or if you don't have uh, ActiveSync clients, then we also support POP3 and IMAP. So that is just as basic as it gets. POP3 just is a, a simple mechanism that stores all your email messages on the server. And uh, you, the, the verb they usually use is you pop your mail. So you download your mail from the server to a local machine. You can configure POP to store the messages on your server, but if other clients are connecting, they might download it. And it's, it's really an old protocol that's more than 30 years old. And the same with IMAP. IMAP does support uh, folder structures and so on. And you can have, uh, leave you, uh, normally leave your mail on an IMAP server but there's no support for calendars and things like that. So um, POP3 and IMAP is, is mostly uh, supported for uh, people that don't or can't run uh, Outlook or um, say they need some application that, that needs to send mail or, or retrieve mail from the server. Um, for those you would sometimes run POP or IMAP for. So uh, with that, uh, let's talk about uh, Auto Discover, a very important feature in client access services. Yeah, Auto Discover is a biggie. That was introduced in Exchange 2007. Mm. Uh, and at the time, I believe it was Outlook 2007 also was the first version of Outlook that uh, supported the Auto Discover service. So uh, the way Auto Discover, I mean, it, it works differently depending on whether or not you're connecting from a domain uh, joined client or a non-domain uh, connected client. Uh, but basically what it gives you is through the use of just entering your email address and password, it uh, simplifies the, the, the configuration and, and creation of your Outlook profile. Uh, it gives you a bunch of um, settings, uh, connection settings, and also uh, the necessary URLs to connect to different web services, whether it be the availability service for free busy information, uh, the OAB uh, virtual directory for offline address book information, things like that. And so basically the way it works is when you install Exchange, for every Exchange server that you install, um, there is a SC, what's called a service connection point object that is created in Active Directory. Um, and this service connection point object uh, contains some attributes in, 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 in Active Directory, uh, one of which is called the service binding information uh, attribute. And that service binding information attribute, the value of it is actually the uh, URL that points to the autodiscover.xml in the autodiscover virtual directory of that server. Mm. So if my server name is LO, you know, london-ex1 and I were to look at the service uh, binding information parameter, it would be https colon slash slash uh, london-ex1 slash autodiscover slash autodiscover.xml. So what happens, the way this works is that when you start Outlook, uh, the Outlook client uh, sends an LDAP query to Active Directory mm -hmm. looking for the service connection point object. And uh, once that's located, the, uh, that information is returned back to the client in an XML blob. And in that blob, it has the URL, that service binding information parameter. So the client then does a HTTP connection to the Exchange server in question. 
and contacts the autodiscover.xml um, file. And therefore, then what the autodiscover.xml file does is it points to the other URLs for the web services like the availability service. There's a virtual directory for you know availability for, for uh, OAB, and then it returns all, you connect to those web services. Okay, so uh, uh, autodiscover really makes it simple for uh, clients to configure themselves. Yes. Because uh, in the old days, when you set up Outlook, you had to know a couple of things like, uh, what's my username, what's my password, what is my server? What's the name of the server? That was the one and that And it's like, people. why uh, do I need to know this? And so Auto Discover removes that pain yes. so that you don't have to know these things. You just know your password, which you have to know anyway, and your email address. And if you don't know your, your own email address, then uh, nobody is going right. to ever send you email. And, and I only you know, mentioned Outlook, but uh, also for most mobile devices these days support Autoscover. So it really simplifies uh, configuring your mobile device with, with uh, an exchange account. Okay. Well, yeah. so it makes a lot of sense. But so Autodiscover uh, gives you a lot of information. Here's, here's an example of some of the information that is returned in that blob to the user. So... Uh, the display name is one of them, uh, the server, Outlook Anywhere, or RPC CAS, depending on the version of Exchange that you run, it returns that information to Outlook so that Outlook knows where to connect to. The alias, availability service, where is your out-of-office URL set, uh, the OAB download location, if you're running unified messaging, what is that URL um, so that you can um, do unified messaging um, operations in Outlook. What is OWA? Uh, this is handy information, so at least Outlook can show the user. If you want to know what is your Outlook URL, this is the Outlook URL, so it displays that as part of the properties in Outlook. Your ECP URL, so that's for user self-management. Authentication package, so this is how will Outlook authenticate with Exchange. And then any other mailboxes that uh, you have access to, so that, uh, that those can be populated in Outlook as well. And if you have a public folder, and, and so those will be displayed as well, and archives, and, and so on. So uh, auto-discover is um, something that a lot of people think, oh, I only need it to configure the client once. If it's configured, then I don't need to worry about it again. But that would not be true because Auto Discover is one of those features in Exchange that needs to work, otherwise the client will not be able to connect on an ongoing basis. Like it wouldn't be able to find free busy information of other users. It might be able to connect and, and like you might be able to get mail and yes. send it ma mail back and forth, but mm -hmm. can you look up somebody's free busy? No. Um, can you download, if you're working in cache mode, could you download your offline address book? No. Those things you need, Autodiscover auto needs to be working before those things will be working. Yeah. So, and, uh, yeah. Um, so there's a lot of things that, that, that allows you to, to make sure that uh, when, if Autodiscover is running, then the clients will be happy. If Autodiscover is not running, then things will behave. Help oddly. desk will start getting a lot of calls. Yeah. So... Uh, uh, I think Auto Discover again. Uh, the uh, if you go to the our course edX course, then you'll find a lot more details in terms of how to set up Auto Discover to make sure that it works properly in all environments. Well, one point that's probably uh, we should probably mention is that the example that I gave was just for when I talked about a service connection point object, how you connect, and that's only true for domain connected clients. Mm. If you're non-domain connected, well, how are you going to get that service binding information attribute from the service connection point object? You can't because you have no knowledge of Active Directory. Mm. So in that sense, um, th there's a whole algorithm that Outlook clients will try to in order to connect to Discover and begins with the SCP object. Then it tries DNS. Mm. And, you know, um, so... It, at most of the times, in, in whether you're internal or an external user, you're going to find an A record uh, in internally and, and externally that was created for Autoscover that maps to the entry point for the Autoscover. And it'll look for um, that URL for Autoscover uh, using DNS. And if it can't find that, then I think it's in this order, it tries HTTP redirect. And then finally, it, it tries to find it uh, using a um, uh, service resource record. In, okay. in DNS. So 
for domain connect clients, you want to be able to connect through the service connection point object. For non-domain uh, clients, you hopefully will be connecting using DNS, but because you can't through this uh, service connection point object. Okay, yeah. So it makes a lot of sense to make sure that you covered all your bases, so you don't just cater for your domain connected clients, but you also have the ability for people that out there uh, on the internet that they also will be able to find the auto discover endpoint and find the configuration settings. So in terms of the Outlook connectivity, uh, we also need to think about how do exchange and, and clients connect to the exchange servers and find their mailboxes and how do clients connect to mailboxes if you have multiple sites? And then an uh, 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 option when you could have exchange connectivity is Outlook Anywhere. So Outlook Anywhere was the default connectivity mechanism for Outlook in Exchange 2013, and we uh, introduced Mappy over HTTP in Service Pack 1 for Exchange 2013, and that is now uh, recommended as the primary way that you should do um, connectivity in Exchange uh, Server 2016. So all of these mechanisms allow those clients to connect to the Exchange servers and, and, and get their mail so that uh, Outlook clients can work. So if we look at uh, this client connectivity, if you have, if you see all of these um, different devices on your left side, there's the mobile devices, uh, web clients, and Outlook clients. All of them uses HTTP to connect. And then you have POP, which uses the POP uh, protocol, IMAP, the POP uh, protocol. And then SMTP clients that want to send mail will use SMTP um, to send mail messages. Uh, but most clients nowadays uh, that's got a rich experience where you have full cal calendar functionality and you also have uh, tasks and so on, the productivity side of Outlook. Those clients use HTTP, whether it's the Outlook client itself or it is Outlook on the web, which is also HTTP, so it uses uh, uh, HTTP encrypted uh, HTTPS so that um, it can serve up the information to the user. So all of those clients will use um, yeah, web-based in fact, lines. In fact, these days you have to use HTTP. So mm. uh, for like Outlook, mm. you're either connecting using Outlook Anywhere or most recently with the uh, uh, Service Pack 1 for Exchange 2013, uh, Mappy over HTTP. But the days of connecting using just pure Mappy, uh, those are gone. Yeah. And then mobile devices as well, Active Sync, the Active Sync protocol is also just using the default HTTP connections uh, to allow connection to your mailbox server. So all of those, uh, and, and, and that's a good thing because usually uh, most networks allow HTTP and so everything is now on HTTP. It doesn't matter what they run on there. It's, uh, HTTP allows it to get to the other side. In terms of Mappy over HTTP, we um, added this functionality because uh, originally when we introduced uh, Outlook over uh, Outlook Anywhere or RPC over HTTP, what we did is we took Mappy. Mappy is the protocol that uh, it's an application protocol that Outlook uses to connect to the Exchange server. So Mappy understands things like create new message, uh, create new calendar items. So the Mappy commands and Mappy yeah, properties. Mappy. Yeah, all of those operations are wrapped inside of RPC. An RPC is a function of the operating system. This is remote procedure control. And the way RPC works is your uh, client connects to another RPC client. It first checks if what port RPC is running on, and there's a specific port that runs on Exchange Server called the RPC Endpoint Mapper, and it finds out what port connects it's on, and it will then connect on that port. Um, so there's a lot of back and forth with RPC, and Microsoft then introduced uh, RPC over HTTP, which actually wraps RPC packets inside of HTTP packets. So now, you know, this is like uh, a present inside of a present <laughs> inside of a present. One of those Russian um, <laughs> yeah. boxes that... Yeah, uh, one of those Russian dolls that you just never know when it's going to stop. Um, so it, it becomes pretty complex, and there's a lot of overheads associated with this to, to actually build up a connection between one point and another point, there's a lot of acknowledgements that needs to happen between the two. And um, 
the exchange server uh, compensated for a lot of those by opening up multiple connections to the server so that uh, it can send data and receive data at the same time. RPC in, RPC out. Yes. Or RPC in underscore data yeah. underscore out, right. So there was a lot of those extra connections that was uh, needed to sort of sustain this connection. And a it, lot of overhead. And if it broke down, you had to build it up again. So it took a long time if you got disconnected from well, the Especially server. when I, I know I can relate when you go from like wired to wireless. Yes. Back and forth. Yeah. So there was a lot of things happening uh, and to, to do that. And so uh, with uh, Mappy over HTTP, rem we removed RPC and we put Mappy directly in HTTP. So there's, it's now only single wrapped. So uh, we took the Mappy commands and we converted them to uh, normal HTTP protocol, which we just sent and request back from the server. So now we basically have uh, one uh, long living connection to the exchange servers. We, we issue these commands and then we have these small uh, short living connections that we connect, we send something, we receive back. And now the long living connection can survive these connection uh, changes and so because on. you use an HTTP, mm -hmm. um, you have more uh, visibility into transport errors, mm -hmm. and uh, recoverability is, is a lot quicker. Yeah, so Mappy over HTTP is a much better way to to allow connections, and 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 we're no longer reliant on RPC and and the functionality that's uh, provided in RPC, and so uh, this this could be. Um, uh, a mechanism to allow people to do better authentication as well. Um, what if you, so th that I assume um, depends on what version of Outlook or the client you're using, right, for it yeah. to work? So Outlook is, uh, is a dependency here as well because the older versions of Outlook doesn't support uh, Mappy of HTTP. So you need to have Outlook 2013 Service Pack 1 right. uh, running, which supports Mappy of HTTP, or Outlook 2016. Yeah. Um, what about those? What if you don't? So if you don't, then you have to go back to RPC of HTTP or Outlook you can, Anywhere. You still use uh, yes. Outlook Anywhere. Right? Yes. And there's still some caveats that we haven't talked about. I believe that if you have migrated from a 2013 organization that did not, where you did not enable Mappy over HTTP, and then you install Exchange 2016, check my thinking on this, then Mappy over HTTP will remain disabled, correct? Yeah. You have to go in and manually uh, yeah. toggle so it. So by default, in that case, it will be disabled. It wouldn't be available for people to connect on. And so um, in that case, you have to go and manually enable it because you know that all your clients are ready to, to make those connections. In terms of the last uh, module here, we just, oh, we need to, cover what is the client access services that's also provided with Exchange. And um, those are the availability service. So this is runs as part of uh, the Exchange server, uh, uh, a service that provides availability information to clients that want to query that. So if you want to be, book a meeting room or you want to uh, book a meeting with your colleagues and you want to see when they are available, then the availability service allows you to get that information. And it allows you to then, uh, <coughs> you send this query to the exchange server and the exchange servers will go and check in the mailboxes to see what is the valid up-to-date current information and then only return the information that you are looking for. It's not going to um, do all the searching and so on and uh, return a lots of information that you have to parse. It's, it's concise only information that you need. We also have mail tips, so uh, part of the exchange system provides mail tips to users. Mail tips is one of those features that just tries to avoid sending unnecessary emails. So for example, if you send a message to a large distribution list, it will give you a tip to tell you that you are sending this message to 500 users. Are you sure you want to send it to 500 users? And you can also add custom mail tips. You can say, uh, for example, uh, this is the CEO's mailbox. Are you sure you want to send a message to the CEO's mailbox? You know, this might be a career limiting move. <laughs> so don't do that. Um, so mail tips is one of those things as well that is provided by the client access services. Um, if you want to connect non out to clients to client access services, so uh, like for example, you want to uh, connect the application server and so on to um, your client access services. You have 
a number of options. You can use POP3 or IMAP. So if your client application can use POP3 or IMAP, that's one option. Another option is if it is aware of EWS, the Exchange Web Service, it can use the Exchange Web Service to connect to that um, Exchange server as well. So that is how you would connect non-clients. For uh, end users, if they can't run Outlook, then I would recommend that they rather use uh, Outlook on the web, so in a web browser, because that is the full rich experience of Outlook, rather than degrading them to a POP3 or IMAP experience where they can't have a calendar and things like that. So rather give them a great experience through a web browser than giving them uh, a mail client that only supports pop3 uh, because that's that's you know then they're going to feel like a second rate citizen so if if they're running an operating system that doesn't run outlook then give them access and tell them to use oa and, and these days with as as, as feature rich as out not oa Outlook on the web. Yes. <laughs> as feature rich as Outlook on the web is, um, there's no reason not to use it these days. It's just great. It's, yeah. It's, it's um, you know, if you put it next to Outlook, it's not exact, but it's we're really getting there. Yeah. So it's 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 and and sometimes there's even features in uh, Outlook on the web that's not in Outlook. Exactly. And so uh, you know, people that are used to that experience is is going to love it. Yeah. So. Um, that brings us to the end of our client access services overview and I uh, hope you stay tuned for an overview on Outlook on the web.